A very warm welcome to this latest live webinar session on Sport for Business. We've done a number of them over the course of the lockdown so far, and hopefully as we begin to emerge blinking into the light, they will have offered some insight, some guidance, and some assistance to everybody working across the Sport for Business community. I have absolutely no doubt that today's is going to be of very similar stature. I'm delighted and thrilled to be joined by, uh, by three leading lights within the role or within that side of sport, uh, which is dominated by gender as things stand at the moment. I continually say that I hope the day will come shortly when we won't have to have uh, webinars about women in sport or women's sport, that we will just have webinars about sport. But for the moment, we need soldiers on the ground who are actually fighting to make sure that that happens. And amongst them, I'm delighted that we have today to welcome uh, Jenny Egan, who is <coughs> taking time out for her preparations to make it to Tokyo 2021 uh, on the water again, which is great to see. And Jenny will be joining us shortly now in a moment. Uh, Nora Stapleton, who has competed herself in the Women's Rugby World Cup here in Ireland, uh, has played high-level sport across a number of different codes and is now working across an even bigger number of different codes as the, uh, as the, the, the women in sport lead at Sport Ireland. So uh, very warm welcome to Nora to join us. And finally, uh, Sene Naupu, who is uh, well known in, across rugby circles, uh, Ireland international, uh, regular for Leinster and a real voice for the players as well as a real voice in all sorts of different areas as well. Sene, you've been a great ambassador over the last couple of years and uh, delighted, very warm welcome to you for joining us as well. Just before we get into the, 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 the meat of the debate, I just wanted to bring you through my own perspective as to why I think this is an important debate that we need to be having at the moment. And the, the, the question that really arises is whether COVID-19 has been gender neutral. We know that it has in terms of its impact on the world's population. Uh, it takes no heed of race, colour, creed, um, you know, and the, the way that it has, has struck us down has been, has been uniform. But we're in the business of sport and there are a number of issues which have raised concerns in my mind over the last couple of months about whether it has actually been neutral in terms of it. So I just want for a moment to look briefly through this lens as to how it has impacted on sport in terms of sport which is played by men and sport which is played by women just before uh, our, our, our ladies join us. One of the first sponsorship stories to break in the, in the course of the last two months was the fact that Tyrrell's Crisps were exiting their sponsorship of the Women's uh, Premier League in rugby, the top flight of, of women's club rugby over in England. Uh, they were coming to the end of a two-year cycle and they had decided, presumably for business reasons and many others, that maybe it had served its purpose and it wasn't going to be the case. But while all sponsors have been uh, you know, very good in terms of you know, sticking to the plan and making sure that they were there as supporters of sport and being seen as supporters of sport in the fans, it struck me that while Gallagher's are making no comments about exiting from the English men's premiership, uh, Guinness and Heineken, both of whom are good Sport for Business members, have also been very strong in terms of their support for the men's game, that the one which was dipping out of it was on the women's side of the game. Just a, a, a slight alarm. No such fears in the sponsorship of the, the Women's Premier League. Barclays came on board last season uh, to really sort of lift that and bring it along to, a, to another level altogether. And we're, <clears throat> we're very fortunate. We've got a number of great Irish internationals who are playing over in the, in the, the Women's um, Super League at the moment. But the issue that caused me concern was that while we were driven demented by commentary and analysis and manager interviews and all of the rest of it about whether the men's Premier League was going to come back, where it was going to come back, whether it was going to be in neutral grounds, whether the players were going to be tested, whether they were going to come into contact training, a thousand different arguments and debates across the, the news media. The FA, in the midst of this, just decided very quietly, almost as a footnote, that the Women's Super League for the season, uh, you know, draw, coming to a, a conclusion now, was actually going to be stopped. So the 2020 season just ended. And it was that different treatment which just gave, gave me 
cause for concern. It was only in the Premier League because in Germany, which was ahead in terms of bringing back the Bundesliga, that debate just never arose, that the Bundesliga came back and the Women's League with our own Claire O'Riordan starring for MSV Duisburg uh, in that league as well. That has come back. So there's mix and match as to how the sports are being treated differently. Uh, in the United States, the National Women's Soccer League, uh, the first uh, major league sport to come back in the States is going to be this competition up in Utah, Utah on June the 27th. It's going to run for a month. The final and the opening game are going to be broadcast live on CBS, which gives uh, cause for a, you know, great optimism in terms of a significant audience that's going to be on, on board for that. And it was also interesting to look at some of the negotiations and the background that went on to it. It's a month-long tournament being held in a biosecure uh, area, but all of the players were guaranteed central contracts to come over and play. There was accommodation sought and managed for players who were coming over, either traveling on their own or with young families as well. And everything just seemed to be done in the right possible way. So it was a good signal and one that I just thought was slightly lacking uh, closer to home in terms of the English Premier League. On the positive sides of it as well, we have seen a closer coming together, I feel, of ladies football, the GAA and Camogie. Gaelic games are as one in terms of most clubs and how they treat them. And all three of them have been very much in line in terms of the return to play protocols which are going to be produced over the coming days and in terms of managing people's expectations. So there wasn't a case of the men's game going in one direction and the women's games going in another. All of them were very much close together and, and, and right on top of things. Um, we're going to be joined a little bit later by Joe Mooney, the sponsorship manager of Lidl, who will be able to talk about the good work that they've been able to do throughout this, working with Ladies Football and the Jigsaw Mental Health Charity in terms of reaching out to kids, to players, and just doing really good stuff within this whole space. So sponsors, sporting bodies, tied around uh, you know, the idea of promoting women's sport have been very much to the fore in that too. Uh, finally, one positive that I really liked and enjoyed was into Sport Elveries. They've been running a promotion whereby they're donating five euros from the cost of, of a jersey in both uh, football and rugby uh, to frontline charities. And in all of their promotion and in all of their advertising for that, it has been very much to the fore that you've seen uh, men and women shoulder to shoulder, whether in the operating theatre or as we know that they certainly should be and will be on the field of play as well. So the, 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 in order to just sort of bring us into the debate, I just wanted to highlight one thing which we'll be carrying tomorrow morning as well about a, a new survey which is going out from Sport Ireland linking together uh, you know, coaches across all of the various different codes. And Nora has been very much to the fore in terms of making sure that the whole question of women in sport doesn't disappear off. So uh, with that in mind, and with all of those uh, elements, I just want to, um, I want to bring our speakers back into, into view. So there should be the four of us now. And um, again, a very warm welcome to you all. Nora, I said there that we were that we, we were looking at sport in its widest possible context, and we don't necessarily want to focus or feature on one and pick it out as being either particularly good or particularly bad. But you're seeing the way in which sport is handling the crisis of COVID-19 across so many different sports. In fact, every sport that is funded by Sport Ireland, your job is to make sure that women in sport is still keeping its place on the discussion table, on the agenda. How have you been finding that over the course of the last two and a bit months? Um, yeah, thanks Rob, and thanks for having me on. Um, I think like, the response to that question is where do you even start? Because you know, there's just been so much happening um, within Sport Ireland and then, like, I suppose, down into the various NGBs and the local sports partnerships. I know certainly when COVID-19 kicked off and you know, the restrictions started coming in and things like that, people thought, oh, does that mean we're going to get quiet? And if anything, it's actually really ramped up the level of activity occurring within Sport Ireland. Um, how have we been connecting with the sports? So the NGB unit have obviously been the ones in direct contact with the NGBs, and that's pretty much nearly happening on a daily basis. You know, there's been regular contact there. 
um, obviously there was support and advice for when sports realised they had to close down. And then as soon as we started looking at the return to sport or back to sport, it all became apparent that we need to start looking at various protocols for that to happen. So for my role, I'm very much linking in with the staff members who are linking in with the NGBs, I guess, from that level. Um, constantly talking to the various directors to ensure that women in sport is remaining, first of all, in the forefront of their mind, um, so that whenever they're seeing protocols coming through or when they're liaising with the NGBs, that we're able to spot if there are any red flags when it comes to maybe um, male side of the game being prioritised over the female side of the game. Um, so that's quite an important factor, and, and that would have been very much within the early days. Um, certainly within the early days as well, when this all started kicking off and we were kind of developing the new normal, um, I would have held a, a Zoom call with some of the NGB women in sport leads. Um, and that conversation would have been maybe a little bit similar to this one. Uh, the topic was on COVID-19 and potential impact that it could have on women in sport within the NGBs or women in sport within this country. So in that call, we kind of we flagged some you know, we looked at concerns maybe that the staff members had um, potential impacts, but we also looked at opportunities. Um, and certainly for myself and for a lot of others, it was about spotting those opportunities and even spotting how we're now starting to change the way we work. So very much the same as, you know, how we've all adapted to what we're doing. A lot of the NGBs, like if they were running coaching programs or refereeing programs or any kind of leadership programs, they all moved those online pretty quickly. Um, so that was fairly, you know, really good reactive approach by them. And um, they certainly were able to see the benefits of doing that. And some have even said that actually they're getting a better response from moving online than they would have if they had have tried to run coaching courses um, in Dublin, for example, where people would have to travel into or coaching courses in the evening when people just don't have, you know, they mightn't have that free time. So I think we're seeing a lot of the benefits there um, from that move and just from the new way of of working now. Um, I guess some of the main concerns maybe that were flagged were in and around the likes of mass participation programs but the whole thing around those is that's going to be the same whether it's male or female or mixed events you know we have to adhere to whatever the government guidelines are um, and certainly like we don't know what those mass participation programs are going to look like yet um, and that's both for the local sports partnerships and for the NGBs. Um, but then we've seen some kind of recreative thinking. So you had male local sports partnership that and they were due to host their, their annual mini marathon or their women's mini marathon. And they moved that online and they got something like a thousand um, people to sign up to it. And a thousand people ran the marathon within their own 2K radius, which it was at the time. So that just shows you a real positive response to it. Um, I think like overall at the minute when we look at like has there been an imbalance towards male side of the game or male male athletes we're not seeing it yet from a Sport Ireland point of view um, and maybe yet is the wrong word I shouldn't use that either like when you look at carded athletes they're all going to go back once the once the protocols allow them whether it's male female once the once the rowers are allowed to return they're going to return you see Jenny's back training um, Cardiff funding will remain the same for everyone the whole way through next year and they've been given that guarantee. Um, when golf reopened it was for all members male female same with tennis um, and same with the sports that have opened so um, certainly yeah as I said we're we're keeping a close eye on it we obviously have the expert group as well who are liaising um, with the NGBs and the NGBs have to send them their protocols and um, in that expert group they've also flagged if any protocols come back that show any signs of gender inequality. Um, when it comes to either reopening or the reintroduction of leagues or competitions, or anything like that, um, then that's something that they're all looking for and that'll be dealt with within that expert group. Um, so that's pretty positive as well, that everybody is kind of up to speed um, when it comes to, you know, we just, I guess women in sport has come so far that the main thing now is people understand that it's ingrained in every NGB's kind of core work practices that they do every day. Just because we give women in sport funding doesn't mean that that's the only program that those NGB's um, run. You know, the, the NGB's have lots and lots of women in sport programs and initiatives and activities 
um, we provide funding to some of those but it's important to know that they're doing so much more work um, outside of those programs as well and and as I said women in sport is a it's an, an agenda item on every NGB's meetings now or, or it should be um, and I haven't seen anything that's causing me too many like major alarm bells yet. Okay it is great to see we've got We've got, um, looking at, I think there's 18, 19 maybe sports NGPs that are actually in the, in the room here. Hello to, to everyone that's, that's joined us and listening in. Is there, is, is there a possibility that because the whole debate around women in sport has had to bring people together in an off the field way so that we have been hosting talks and, and doing things like this? I know Swim Ireland were very quick to move their We Play uh, you know, seminar from a live environment out at the at the National Sport Campus, uh, the Sport Island Campus, through to, to the online environment. Is there a potential that those who were committed to women in sport may have actually been able to adapt a little better and a little little bit quicker in these times? Um, yeah, I, I guess so. Um, I think, so your kind of question there, like, do we have to keep doing women in sport standalone um, events and activities and I think there will be a continuous need for that for you know another few years but we're certainly going to see like how that is merging across all sports topics now um, and it definitely comes down to the organizers and those who are um, running the various events to ensure that they have um, a gender neutral lens when they're putting the event together and when they're bringing in panelists and, and various people to be involved in them as well um, and I know like from everyone's point of view we just obviously want to get to the stage where we're talking about sport, but at the same time, how, you know, like women's, I, I sometimes I don't mind when the term women's is put in front of a sport, as long as we do the same for men's, because it's how you differentiate between two competitions sometimes, and I wouldn't be overly sensitive about that. Okay. Um, Jenny, I want to bring you in. Uh, congratulations on getting back on the water um, and on uh, the way that you've been conducting yourself as well. Nice features on, on RCE and being out there, sort of putting, putting yourself forward. You've been to the fore in terms of this uh, you know, debate about uh, you know, discussing equality. But in your own sports and in individual sports, let's sort of, you know, if we gathered them together as the kind of the Olympic group of, of sports, um, there, there isn't that imbalance. Has there, been, has there been anything that you've seen in relation to how, you know, the women in your sport, and I know your CEO, Moira, is, uh, is, is one of the few women in, in, uh, in positions of sporting leadership as well. How have you seen it uh, coming through in terms of the momentum that we had? Has it maintained or has there been a, a challenge in the face of just such a, a, a bigger mountain to climb in terms of COVID? Yeah, thanks Rob for having me. Um, yeah, so as you say, my sport's an individual sport, so we've all been treated very equally by Sport Ireland as well. You know, crowded athletes have been guaranteed funding, both men and women, and we're always treated equally um, by Sport Ireland with the same targets. So as an individual sports person, um, we will be treated very equally. And yet, like I say, Moira Aston is one of three female CEOs of NGBs in Ireland, the other two being Sarah Keenis from Ireland and Michelle Carpenter, Rowing Ireland. So we're in a great situation, Canoeing Ireland as well, and um, to have a female leader um, really pushing forward also. So yeah, from my, my perspective, it hasn't really been any unequal between men and women. But I think if you look at team sports, it's a little bit different. And um, within Ireland, it seems to be quite equal at the moment. But if you look at, like you say, the Premier League in England, they're coming back to competition, but the women's league is just completely cancelled. And I think it's really good to look at then in Germany, how the men's league is coming back or has come back and the women's league has come back and the men's league has supported the women's league in coming back by raising two million dollars i think it is to help them so i think there's two very different aspects um individual sports you know when i competed at world championships men and women are both at the same world championships but for team sports they're usually separate so like separate world cups for men and women so they're totally separate entities in terms of will one world cup go ahead or when will one world cup not go ahead so that's the two kind of different aspects so i think that's why when looking at the individual sports and the team sports they kind of have to be looked at in different ways so for me like i say i feel equal to men in my sport but i think probably 
for team sports, it'll, it's a little bit different. Okay. Um, talking about that on the, on the team sport of it, side of it, Sene, rugby, perhaps 10 years ago, it's not unfair to say rugby would have been on the, the wrong side of the spectrum in terms of it, a sense of equality, in terms of the way that it was played and, and possibly managed. Uh, albeit there was one member of the of the uh, the IRFU's committee who was a woman. It's getting a little bit better now, but it has certainly been getting better in terms of the you know the way that the sport is seen now. Um, when they expanded the Council on World Rugby, it was to bring in you know a third of the of the new input, or a third of the overall input, uh, were going to be from the women's side of the game. Um, we've hosted a Rugby World Cup, which generated enormous media coverage and, and everything else. Real momentum coming behind the whole area of, of women's rugby. Do you think has it translated through? Has that kept on the agenda now? Because it may be a media thing, but we hear an awful lot about the Guinness Six Nations coming back and the realignment of world rugby. And the photographs that accompany it tend to be the men. The story and the narrative tends to be the men as well. Can you reassure us that the women's side of the game is still in there chipping away and it's just us media that aren't taking enough heed? <laughs> Obviously, hi Robin, hi everyone watching. Um, thanks for having me on this discussion. Um, she's certainly been a hard slog in terms of, you know, on that journey towards a vision where there's equal opportunity for girls and women in rugby in all aspects of the game, you know, not just as a player. Um, and certainly there was a time where there was enormous influence on, uh, I suppose, the possibilities of it in Nora's playing era, you know, in terms of those sorts of positive things that's happened, say, within Ireland. Um, yeah, but certainly, uh, I suppose, COVID overall in the last sort of couple of months has, has almost highlighted, um, it's highlighted areas of vulnerability to financial sustainability for the sport itself, which meant that there was going to be a reliance on some conversations very heavy on the men's game as the cash cow, um, you know, at, at this time, and, and that was understandable. Uh, but also, it also provided an opportunity where, uh, say, myself and, and a colleague of mine, Rachel Burford, as two members of our commission on the International Rugby Players to then, you know, ensure that we got the Global Council of Players, um, women players for the women's game, that we got everyone on the same page to ensure that we still push the voice from from behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, in terms of that equality piece that you're saying and, and driving that momentum, there's certainly been challenges, obviously, within these last couple of months. Absolutely. Um, challenges over the last decade. Um, but it's almost the opportunity has provided us a chance to reflect and then use what we know will get things over the line around this time. And a lot of it is is actually, in all honesty, it's it's there's been a lot of hard work behind the scenes um, with us as players who are involved. Um, and uh, there have been some small wins without the, throughout these last uh, six weeks, for example, um, which has been really positive for us. So in terms of a momentum gainer, um, absolutely. You know, in terms of having had that facilitated by an organization like International Rugby Players and its member organizations from the player associations around the world, and then also its Global Player Council with regards to um, the representatives that, that uh, on that group, for example, all of the captains across the okay. world. So having that full noise of voice over these last couple of months has actually, you know, unified us, us in a way that we probably never really had that, um, you know, opportunity to focus on ensuring that we had the full noise. So, um, you know, some small wins, for example, were um, making sure that we were part of the decision making or making sure that we're part of that scenario planning on when these international fixtures for this year, that the remainder of the schedule of this year, and then also leading into 2021, um, that we were absolutely a part of it. Because it was more than just, you know, flippantly throwing a date for a contingency whenever it was, for example, if it was quarter two, you know, that raises a host of issues where us as players, you know, 15's game for most part is amateur. Yeah, there's some unions that are semi-pro, some that are fully pro, which is which is fine, depending on the unions who are mandated towards the direction of the women's game. Um, but certainly, you know, the majority of seven teams that are qualifying for the World Cup for three different events, one's in Asia, one's in Europe, um, you know, and then to, you know, to make a decision quite flippantly like that um, actually gave us an opportunity to say, well, hey, hang on, 
you know, you know, you know, on behalf of seven countries, um, you know, in a World Cup year, this is what it looks like. You're, you're asking us to play 13, up to 13 games in one year, a World mm -hmm. Cup year, let alone any year, when you might typically play five to eight games a year. So, you know, those sorts of thinking and the strategy, you know, policy direction in terms of what us players offer was really important. And in terms of how we delivered that approach was really important. Um, having the discussions and, you know, little things like, little things that are really important. And you guys will appreciate this as being part of committees or um, within an organization, if you're in the leadership of an organization, the smallest things and empowering whoever's on the, the call to speak up. So those sorts of things are really important throughout this last number of weeks in terms of uh, driving the momentum of the women's game. So I'm only really speaking from a player point of view and then a lot of the work that we've been doing as part of the commission, because that's absolutely our role. We need to, we, we've, we've needed to make sure that the women's game isn't on the back seat to the men's game. At the same time, acknowledging and appreciating that absolutely the men's game is the cash cow at the moment where they need to generate the revenue. Yes, absolutely. And we have um, full support of our, our brothers playing the game, the men's game. Like we absolutely, you know, they're doing some fantastic work behind the scenes and all that stuff as well. But certainly from a, a woman's point of view, um, I feel that the, the, this opportunity has actually brought us together probably a bit more, um, a bit more strategically and probably in a way that we might not have had the opportunity to do so. Um, I'll also add that within, you know, the way that, um, so Omer is the CEO of our ERP organization has been excellent in terms of, you know, empowering Rachel and I to help drive certain things, be a bit more hands-on, more so than maybe usual. I think that's just um, you, you know, natural when you're passionate about something. Um, and all of the captains around the world have been excellent, you know, all their contribution towards certain things. Um, it's, it's highlighted our importance on how the processes work, on how we actually make sure that all the voices are heard so that when we go in, we're representative of everyone, not just ourselves, our England, Ireland, for example, you know, um, Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere. So it's actually taken a, quite a bit of a, um, bit more holistic, a bit deeper of a, you know, um, process than what we would have ever had imagined, really. Um, two things that were really, really important, uh, me personally, and then as a global game, and one of them was to ensure that uh, the World Rugby had funding for the women's game, that we, our funding was not going to be cut. So we needed to, first of all, make sure that that was the case. And then obviously the next step is then for the guardians of the game across the world, which is the unions, that, you know, to ensure that they then obviously um, do the, the work that they need to do in terms of the guardians of their games in the country and how they're mandated toward, towards the girls and women's growth of the game. And the second thing was to, first one was the funding, the second one to, was to make sure that the women's game stayed the strategic priority for World Rugby because they had stated that publicly a couple of years ago. We have an excellent relationship with Katie Sadley, the GM for World Rugby. Phenomenal. She's one of my mentors as well. Um, was, you know, in terms of the communication pathways, Rachel and I and her, we work together quite a lot, even though we're an ERP commission, which is kind of, in other sports might sound weird, but it's really important for us in terms of so we understand what's happening at that level you know, and how can we serve and be an antagonist in the right way to challenge in the right way for the right intention of the game. So that's that whole process over the last number of years has been a massive learning curve. Uh, but certainly in the last couple of months, for me personally, it's felt like the last three years was worth it for this moment. And that now we're finally in there and th that level of respect for a full noise for the women's game has been really important. So um, yesterday th there was a meeting with World Rugby Comp, organizer, comp organizers and the unions just with regards to the scheduling that we had had that meeting with World Rugby two weeks ago, which was a real positive because there would have never been a time where we, we were part of it before the unions knew. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, so, so in, a sense, ones, in a sense, that sort of that nourishing of the deeper roots, which has been taking place over the last period of time, has actually had an opportunity now to actually come out into the, into the light a little bit more that otherwise organizations would have still been conducting a, a heads down approach where they were organizing the next tournament and the next qualifiers and everything else. And now they've had a little bit more time to, to reflect, as you say, and to, and to hear the, the arguments that are being put forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there's certainly lo loads of learnings that, you know, from a, say like from within the commission, Global Players Council, but also the relationship between our 
like coaches and management has been awesome, you know, in terms of, you know, aligning certain things. That was really important um, because that all, that all needs to frame the momentum of the women's game. Okay, this is great. I, I, love, I love positive, uh, you know, outcomes. And it, it seems to be that this, you know, this webinar was kind of posited really on the notion that oh, maybe, we're, maybe we're struggling a little bit, maybe we're falling off the, the agenda here. But actually, it could be that we're, that we're even stronger. I mean, Jenny, you've been involved in a number of, of discussions around this as well as, a, as an athlete representative and on the commission. Is, is that side of things that, that Sene has seen from, from rugby at both national and international level. Is that, do you think, something which is actually feeling the same in other sports as well? Yeah, I think, you know, the momentum, like, has to keep going, and I feel it is. Um, there's been so many different articles and interviews with women in sport during COVID-19, and social media has been shown to be so much more interactive at this time. So I think it's probably brought a lot of visibility and light to different women's achievements in sport. And we mightn't have had that opportunity before, like Sene said, in terms of, you know, so much traction to social media and them learning more about women in sport. You know, people are usually so busy. What's the next competition? What am I preparing for? And, you know, always planning, planning, planning. But it has given us an opportunity to reflect and see what women in sport have achieved so far. And I think that's really important. And I think if we can just keep that momentum going, I, th I think we can um, in terms of visibility, um, especially on social media at the moment. Um, but just to keep that visibility going within media of all types um, over the coming months. Um, but, you know, it is very hard because sports aren't being played or competitions aren't happening. So we just have to try and take the time to show what we've achieved so far and what we want to achieve in the future. And I really feel like it is happening. And um, there's great positivity towards women in sport at the moment from anyone I've spoken to. So yeah, definitely it is moving in the right direction. And I know financially it's gonna be difficult for people and teams. We've seen that, um, but hopefully there will be some allowances made and there will be help there for women's sports. And it won't just be taken away just to look and have men's sports come back because the momentum we gained needs to keep going. We've achieved so much so far and we can't let it be lost now. You know, 11.7 million viewers in the UK for the English versus USA semi-final in the World Cup last year. Like, that's phenomenal. That's the same amount of viewers for a Six Nations game or women in, in the UK or more. So people want to see women in sport. They want them to be visible. So why can't we not just keep that going um, and hopefully sponsors and media will support it uh, in the coming years? It is, it is great and it's been notable as well. I know when um, Team Ireland and the Olympic Federation got involved with RTE and they were doing the, the Dare to, to Believe scheme as part of the, the, the school uh, the homeschooling, the hub, um, Claire Lamb was there. I know Claire is in the room uh, at the moment. Hi, Claire. Um, she was there doing a sack race uh, up and down the, the, the playground in, in Skull Lock on in, in, in Monkstown. But again, last night on the, on the RTE News, when we talked about the prospect of athletes coming back into sport, it was notable. Sarah Keane was, was interviewed, um, but it was Sunita that was the, you know, the, the picture image of, of people that are you know, they're coming back. So of all of the, those athletes, women are you know, over-indexing now as, as a result of that. Is that something, Nora, which you're, you're cognizant of in Sport Ireland as well? Because you know, we've, got, we've got the 20 by 20 campaign, which has, you know, was getting great momentum coming into this. Um, AIG, I know I've been voting on, on some of the videos that, that young uh, kids have been putting forward and that's maintained its momentum. We'll speak to Joe in a minute now about how Lidl have been doing it. But those kind of impacts that we, we sort of see and we kind of almost, it just happens. It just passes us by. But everyone that does, it just leaves a little drip, which adds to the momentum and adds to the, to the flavour of what we've got. Is, is it something that you monitor closely in Sport Ireland in terms of that overall conversation that's going on around sport? Um, so I don't monitor it and, uh, you know, I don't collect the data and keep hold of the data, but I certainly notice it. And um, I think a really good example that's worth um, highlighting would be the FEI skills videos. Um, and they were fantastic. They had the men's and women's players taking turns, show, demonstrating the skills 
and encouraging the kids to partake in the skills videos. And then the videos that you saw coming back were excellent as well. And it was boys and girls and the level of skill was, you know, so apparent and you could see like, I think what it probably would have done is if that had just been um, boys, you know, people would people looking at that wouldn't have realized the skills that the young girls had and many of them who were far superior superior than some of the boys as well. So I just think like highlighting that as a platform where it's very simple, you know, if you're doing anything online or if you're doing any kind of competitions or anything like that or skills videos, that it's very easy to do it for boys and girls and have your male and female players uh, promoting it equally and, and being part of it. And I, I really just had to applaud the FAI for the the work that they did in that one and um, I guess like you know a couple of things to note maybe when because sponsorship has come up and um, quite a bit there and I think a lot of sponsors have um, you know said that they will be sticking with some of their sports but you know it's important to note now that there probably are sponsors out there reassessing who they sponsor and um, we're going to like we may even see some women's sports come back sooner than the male side of the game um, because there perhaps won't be crowds at the game um, and things like that. So there's opportunities there where sponsors could come on board um, and be more visible through the female side of the game than for the male side of the game. And, and I think that's really important. But also, you know, something to highlight, which is even more valuable, is the fact that through the research that we're collecting now, we're seeing that female, that, so the participation gradient between men and women is now gone. So as a result of COVID-19, women are now exercising more and um, they're now so they're walking a lot more something like 85 percent of the population are now walking and um, over 56 percent of females are getting their required daily activity each week so they're doing a lot more exercise and they're also the spending power you know they're the ones that are making a lot of the budgeting decisions within households and now they're they're nearly more active than men um, so I think that's really important to note and I think it's probably important for sponsors to realise that as well when they are deciding um, who to sponsor or what event to sponsor, that females, um, how they're exercising now has really gone through the roof and it's something to be mindful of. And some of the sports that they're doing as well or the, the types of exercise they're doing, obviously walking has gone up, but cycling has soared. Uh, running has soared and yoga has gone up and then weightlifting or exercise training as well. Now, why is that going on? You know, why have their habits changed? We don't know. It could be because they're not commuting to work. Um, it could be because they have obviously more time because that journey is taken away. Or it could be because their partners are at home more and they're sharing more of the household duties, more of the maybe children or putting kids to bed or making lunch or, you know, those kind of things. Um, or there's no school runs, it could be that people's um, lives within the household has changed, which has allowed for females to exercise more. So there's just, I think, like when we're talking about has COVID been gender neutral, in some respects, we're seeing that it's benefiting females more because we're exercising more according to the research that we're doing. Okay. I agree. Can I echo, actually, sorry, just quickly, I'll echo what uh, Nora's saying because certainly, you know, in the women's game in rugby, Two years ago, the research uh, indicated that there was about a 40% increase in the retention rate for women and girls compared to boys and men. So that was also, you know, used as one of the leverage in terms of ensuring that that became ultimately the strategic priority. Um, and then certainly exactly what sort of echoing what Nora is saying is, is that timing wise for us in the in, in, with women's rugby, the leverage again is for 2021, you know, to have an Olympics and a World Cup within two to three months of each other, the prime time opportunity to grow your game exponentially in front of the world is the, you know, it's never been done in, his, in the history of any sport to have two forms of your game within that short period of a time that I said to you that the men's game is the cash cow absolutely for now. But, you know, you look in the future, well, maybe the women's game will be the cash cow within that particular um, space, you know, in years to come. But certainly that's a strong... These are strong numbers that the research is, is telling us um, in other sports, but certainly in rugby, it's there. And that's why, you know, for us, it's about encouraging all of the unions to ensure that the mandate is directed towards the growth of girls and women's rugby. I think, I think, that, um, I think those words of for now, they're the, they're the siren call that should be, should be up there. I always knew that once women had an opportunity to actually sort of present themselves in sport, 
uh, to a greater effect that it wouldn't be long before you'd completely take over and rule the world. But that's that's going to be a good thing. Then then we'll just have to fight for it all on, a, on an equal basis. Um, I love what you said there about that player retention, because that was one of the issues in, in Gaelic games as well, which was a, a serious factor that um, Lidl produced research uh, as part of the sponsorship, I think it was two years ago now, we'll talk to Joe in a second, um, which showed that 50% of girls who were playing at the end of their primary school, uh, you know, sort of uh, sta stage, stage in life, uh, were, were playing when they got to the age of 14. So between 12 and 13, we were losing half of the players that were coming through in there. And maybe now that we've all had a chance to, to focus a little bit more on that, that's a good thing. I'm, just, I'm going to bring in Joe, but just before I do that, I just want to launch a little poll. And I guess that the answer to this now, hopefully, might be a little bit different to what, we, what I would have thought that it was at the outset. So I'm just going to put that out there now. If you do, if you have an opportunity to take a look, and let us know your views on it. And while we're doing that, I will just bring Joe back in to the, to the screen. There we go now, almost. We've got Joe, I've got, I've got you sideways on um, as things stand at the moment. There we go. Uh, that's much better now. Um, I thought you were doing some yogic flying or something like that there, Joe. Um, now, your, your microphone is muted, so you might just want to, uh, to, to click on that for us. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the results of that poll, uh, just coming in now, last few to be counted, 54% uh, think that the momentum is the same behind women in sport. 21% uh, think that it has lessened and 25% think that it has increased. So uh, just a couple of more votes to, to tell on that, but uh, very much an even keel. I would have thought that our view might have been that it was lessened coming into this. So maybe we've done some good. Well, not me, but maybe you've done some good. Um, Joe, we've, we, we've spoken there about the, the research that Lidl did in terms of um, player retention from a couple of years ago. And you've been very much to the fore in terms of both supporting women's football, ladies' football, and also reaching out in terms of the mental health issues around Jigsaw and what they've been doing. Can you just talk us a little bit through the, the thinking and the logic that went into it from a commercial perspective in terms of making sure that you were seen to be continuing your support for women in sport? Yeah, 100%. Uh, thanks for having me on, Rob, and thanks to you and the guys there for a very interesting chat so far. Um, for, for ourselves, basically, like we're the title sponsors of the National Football League um, for the LGFA. So we were into, got through five rounds of the seven um, as far as they got before the pandemic hit. And like the league finals and everything else that would have come with it would be obviously a big deal for us being a title sponsor. So once that happened, um, given the, the industry I'm in, the, uh, the supermarket area was obviously, there was, there was a million and one things going on to kind of get ready for what was coming in the line and getting safety and those things in, important, um, important elements in, in place for everyone else. So kind of behind the scenes, we would have been working with uh, Jackie Cahill and all the team at the LGFA were seeing how we could continue to, to activate the sponsorship and, and basically what could we do for the members the, and the membership of the LGFA across the country. Uh, kind of with everything that happened and the shutdown and all the the kind of non-standard things that were happening and, and people were in difficult situations and they were people were out of work people weren't able to go have a go have a kick around with their friends and all that had changed we decided it'd be a it'd be a good idea to to link back in with Jigsaw and the LGFA so earlier on this year at the start of the year we launched the uh, One Good Club program which brought together the LGFA and the Jig and Jigsaw um, who are official charity charity partners even for the first time. And off the back of that, we um, we got on board some new ambassadors to promote that campaign specifically, and um, from across the country to add to our existing ambassadors. And basically, once the once the COVID nineteen hit, we got back in touch with the with the ambassadors and we saw how we could how we could bring Jigsaw to the LGFA membership to, to basically help them and assist them through difficult times because Jigsaw had basically put together a number of new resources to deal specifically with the pandemic and COVID-19 that wouldn't just be um, used for day-to-day -day stuff. It was very specific to, to what was happening. So we used the ambassadors and the LGFA basically to, to come together and promote all of these resources that were happening. And, and even just this week, then again, we've had a, to tie in with when the league would have been starting. 
um, had it gone ahead, uh, tied in for a positivity week where we've been kind of extolling the, the virtues of Jigsaw's five a day for your mental health um, scheme, which basically is a, a straightforward, nice process of, of basically the, the simple things you can do in your everyday life to, to kind of improve that, improve your mental health and kind of have a, have a look at the holistic side of it. Okay, it's like it, you know, it, it, it has been very noticeable and very, and very visible out there as well. And, and it was part of the 20 by 20. Your chapter hasn't begun as yet, but what, what have you done in terms of preparing or planning for that and, and when you're going to bring that to life? Yeah, so uh, that's been quite interesting over the last while. So we we've been kind of in the middle of planning, um, with the with Long Time Spider and the and the team at Twenty by Twenty earlier on in the year around what we were going to do for our chapter, which is all around the benefits of participation. Um, and we'd be looking at things across the country and getting stores involved and all the great ideas that everyone had, um, before the pandemic struck. So. Um, as a result of that, basically we've been we've been working hard um, with the team there and and Tineo, or who we work with as an agency, and um, looking at how we can how we can still activate this chapter. So we're at the stage now where the next over the next couple of months, um, we'll be we'll be activating the the twenty by twenty. Uh, campaign from our own side and really kind of trying to harness the the groundswell of of activity that there's been particularly in, in females as Nora touched on there that the the stats from Sport Ireland are, are amazing with the amount of people and women in particular that are getting involved in running walking cycling whatever it is over the last couple of months and I, I think there's a huge there's a huge opportunity to build on that and to really reinforce all those positive messages and, and ensure that kind of by the time we come out to of the other side of the pandemic that that people who've taken up sport or taken up any sort of activity and exercise that we're, we're going to help them kind of put the tools and, and resources in place that will see them continue that on instead of kind of uh, reverting back to type i suppose okay great stuff um we're, i'm going to open it up now for uh for a, a well a virtual uh, question and answer session i can't see the the whites of your eyes out there and to uh, to, to to get a nod that you wanted to ask a question but they have started to come in um if you if you want to ask a question the easiest way is there's a little q a button down presumably well it's on the bottom of my screen hopefully it's on the bottom of your screens as well uh, and if you just type that in there we'll be able to uh, to put it to the to the panel um we've got we've got the the first of them has, has come in already um, I'm not sure who it's from. It's come up on my screen here as anonymous, um, and it's for you, Nora. It's a, it's a question as to as to what measures or protocols are in place to ensure that the the funding for women in sport programs, in particular, is still retained for women in sport programs. We are conscious of the fact that there will be serious financial pressure on all of the associations. Is there a, a danger that we might need it in order to keep the sport alive in general, as opposed to funding a particular programme for which it was intended in the first place? Um, yeah, no, I, I'm sure that there are kind of fears that are around those dangers. Um, I think like there are no, say, structured protocols in place as such. It's more around the constant dialogue with the NGBs. I mean, obviously, there's huge financial pressure on the NGBs to um, in relation to their own budgets and to to keep their sport alive as you said and um, but for myself it's more so like maintaining that dialogue but finding out well what programs are affected and um, is it something that can be moved online which a lot of ngbs have done some of them have fared the timelines or they've changed timelines for certain programs as well and um, i mentioned some of the participation elements and how participation programs could be um slightly uh, I guess stalled a little bit until we figure out how we can get people um, back on a pitch or back onto um, some form of mass participation type event and um, so it's very hard to say there's there's one rule across the board and um, for some programs like if they couldn't do a participation program they've been talking with me and they've done com something completely different um, but it's still of benefit to their women in sports or it's still a benefit to women and girls within their organisation, whether that's to um, upskill coaches, referees, or to look at the leadership and governance pillar and what's occurring there, or the, the visibility or participation. So it's very much trying to work with NGBs to figure out how we can, um, how we can support their programmes. Um, like we're, we, we're not a fan of taking funding away from NGBs, particularly through this, this period. It's more so let's work together to ensure that we can um, still use that funding to benefit women and girls, which is what it's for. Okay. 
Um, you've been very quiet in the room out there. Uh, no, we have. We've got a. Oh no! As I say, that we're flying in now. Um, we've got one from uh, from Peter Smith, uh, who was uh, the man responsible for that research, which showed that eighty five percent of us are all out exercising now when we're not on Zoom calls. Um, uh, Peter is saying that Jenny made a point that there are differences between team and individual sports in terms of how they deal with the gender issues in sport. The suggestion is that individual sports were a little bit more progressive in that. Um, do we agree as a, as a panel? And if so, what do you think it might be that would be driving those differences? I might ask you first, Jenny, in terms of uh, you being on the individual side. Yeah, so just from my perspective, in terms of, let's say, canoeing, um, women and men compete at the same world championships. Um, so they've, let's say, equal visibility on the YouTube channel Planet Canoe of races being shown. Um, in terms of funding as well, we have equal funding from Sport Ireland. So that, that makes us all equal in terms of the targets we have to achieve and how we have to keep achieving those targets to keep our funding. Uh, sponsorship wise I guess individual sports that's where it might change a bit like maybe there'd be more men sponsored in individual sports than women and that's maybe the area that might be a little bit unequal let's say and um, that sponsors might go to men more than women but just the team the team based sports let's say um, women's football or women's rugby they don't have the same amount of funding or um, as men and women, let's say, whereas, you know, carded athletes of Sport Ireland have the same amount of funding. So that's kind of the area I'm kind of looking at in terms of the funding is the same for individual sports for men and women, but team sports, they wouldn't have the same funding. And then the visibility of men and women's sports in teams wouldn't be the same either um, in terms of there would have been more time for men's sports and women's sports. Now it has obviously gotten a lot better over the last um, few years, but I think kind of that's, they're the two different areas. And for me from canoeing, it's a minority sport. So for me, we're trying to get more visibility for men and women in sports as such, because it's a minority sport. So we're trying to get it out in the public eye as much as possible on equal terms, men and women. So that they're kind of the differences between individual sports and team sports um, and minority sports and, you know, professional sports. So, for me, that they're the areas that need to be worked on for individual sports in terms of minority sports need to get out there more for men and women. And then professional sports and team sports, there needs to be the same visibility for men and women and the same funding opportunities, let's say. Okay. Um, Sene, do, do, do you think, like, do you sometimes look at those individual sports and look to see what lessons you might be able to take in terms of getting that level of it. I always, I always like, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why the Olympics, you know, is, is a very positive force. And one of them is the fact that, you know, it's the same, the same stadium, the same kit that athletes are wearing and you'll get, you'll, you'll get, you know, the men's and the women's events taking place interspersed between them. Are there lessons to be learned that those individual sports have done better? Is it a weight of history thing in terms of team sport that's weighing you back maybe? Oh, there's certainly lessons to be learned. <laughs> and uh, Ginny, that is, that is actually such a super point because um, only from my perspective and in, with all due respect, there's more stakeholders involved in team sports. There's more number of players involved, more number of the need to get that collaborative buy-in into something to make something move. Um, whereas in, with an individual sport, it, it might be from a, you know, even from a movement to achieving something within that particular project program might be slightly more easier because there's people involved. Um, I'll give you a quick example in terms of that numbers game. Uh, when you compare 15s to 7s, it's been done before, which is brilliant in terms of breast practice that exists. So the New Zealand 7s contracts, for example, are 100% equal pay. Um, but, you know, it's very difficult to achieve that in the 15s game. There's so many more players, more stakeholders, you know, so that's another sort of journey on its own. So, you know, to the point where the individual athlete, then absolutely yes. Is this need for the cultural resistance? There's, there's less opportunity for any type of cultural resistance to change and improve something. There's more work needed in managing the, the stakeholders to ensure that everyone's aligned to move forward. Okay. That's my thought on it. 
Okay, no, thanks, Megan. Um, we've got one in from Neve O'Mahony. Um, hi, Neve. Neve did uh, great work with Cork City um, in the in the football game, and then bringing it along to uh, to the whole question of supporters supporting sport in in many different ways. Um, really good thinker, and uh, and delighted to have you here, Neve. Um, you're asking the question. That's the only one. Gender quotas. It's a tricky one. Is it a necessary evil or is it something that we think might actually hold women in sport back a little bit? I'll throw that one to you first, Nora. No way. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think gender quotas, I don't think they're evil. Um, I think, I, I feel really sorry when females say stuff like they believe that they're only being put onto a committee to make up a quota. Um, whether that might be the case at the start, you're now on the committee and you have such an impact on that committee and you can prove yourself to be as much of value um, compared to anyone else on the committee. Um, so if quotas need to be used in order to help fast track our leadership and governance, um, then I'm, I'm in favour of them. Um, that's probably changed maybe a little bit over recent years and, and actually probably I would have been maybe... Um, forced into thinking that quotas were a bad thing because you know it should be whoever's best for the role should be put forward but I've been in this I've been involved in sports for too long now and I've seen how long it takes to change the makeup of committees and leadership and how you address decision making um, and I've seen that there are so many fantastic females out there who have the ability to sit on any committee or any board across any sports and I think that we have too many myths and excuses that we tend to use maybe um, when we have this quota discussion or when we have any kind of discussion around leadership and governance. Um, so I'm just very much of, do you know what, we use quota and we'll, it will fast track stuff. And by using the quota, quite often what you see happens is um, boards will go out of their way to then ensure that they actually get a really good female. So whether that's through application, interview, whatever it might be, they don't rely on the voting structure through. Um, they'll go out of their way to find a really thorough um, method of getting the best female. So you actually end up with really good candidates. And what can also happen is because they put in place that kind of application um, system or method of getting onto a border committee, they also get even better men to sit on the committee because they have to go through the, the same process. So now you've just you've upped the level of skill set um, on boards and committees by by changing how we how we bring that by changing how people get onto them and stuff. So yeah, I'm afraid I if if a code is needed to fast track something, then I'm for it because I've been in been in sport too long. I have to say I think that you know I've uh, you, you don't inherently you don't like the idea of quotas, and when there is equality, you never need them. But we're coming from a point where there is clearly not an equality of opportunity and an equality of representation. You mentioned earlier, Jenny, the fact that there's three women CEOs of sporting bodies. Uh, we looked at to five because we can't forget Helen and Sinead in ladies football and, and Camogie mm -hmm. as well. But still five out of 72, 73, uh, you know, national governing bodies of sport is not representative of the gender balance of people who are actually in sport. So uh, with, uh, with apologies and respect to all of the very good men who are doing those roles, I think we need a few of the women, possibly some of those who are in the room with us here today, uh, to be stepping up in years to come. And we have to bear in mind, it's only 102 years since we, men, uh, allowed women to actually vote in political terms. So... Yeah, we just, just need just to keep on in pushing and, in that direction. Sorry, Rob, just coming in on that. Like, I don't think it's, it's obviously just not in sport about women having um, roles. For instance, I was at a 20 by 20 discussion there and Ron Nugent brought up a great point about how when Joanne Cantwell got the position for the Sunday game, it was like, oh, she only got it because she's a woman. And Ron said, no, she got it because she's good at her job. And that's a big point to get across. It's not just sports, it's across all avenues of life. So... It, there's a te terrible mentality out there about that. Oh, she only got it because she's a woman. They need to have women in those roles. But that's not the case. People, women get it because they're good in those positions. So that's an important point to take from this. Okay. Rob, um, I love that. Rob, I'm sorry to cut in here. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, the committee, the increase in number of females on that committee for World Rugby, which was fantastic. And then the next step, obviously, was to ensure that there's someone on Exco. 
that is a female. So I would absolutely echo what Nora is saying because there was absolutely the opportunity to get some females in to lobby and, and you know, get that seat. Um, but, you know, in terms of that learning, hopefully that there's a lesson there that probably do need a quota. I think sport is, it was particularly in a male dominated sport at the moment where, you know, the confidence is lost from maybe some of the females who could have lobbied for it, but didn't go for it. So yeah, that's where my feeling is. We probably need a quota. Well, and, we um, have, and we have Sue Carty, who was representing Ireland at the IRFU on the uh, on the World Rugby mm -hmm. Council as well, and she's uh, she's in the right age profile, so that maybe next time around, maybe she'll be the one. Uh, and exactly. no matter what, she's very well capable of it. <laughs> and as know. well, Rob, maybe just add in that, um, like any, like when you do see quotas anywhere, like the men on the committee, they're they're just such champions of those females that are on the committee or boards with them. Um, and you really have to, you know, applaud the men as well who are mm. champion females in decision making roles and, and are champion that change that, that we're seeing coming in. Um, and, you know, it is something that we're very vocal about within Sport Ireland towards all the NGBs that we, we must have more females involved in decision making on their boards and committees. But we're seeing so much support coming from the men, which is absolutely key um, and really positive. Okay, uh, Joe, just to bring you in on that, could you imagine the idea of needing to have a gender quota in terms of your employment in, in Lidl head office down there in Tala? Yeah, well, it's, it's probably fairly fair. Um, out in, uh, in HQ in Tala, we're obviously all sitting at home at the moment, but I think, like, I, I, to be honest with you, I'd echo kind of what the what the ladies said there around, around quotas, like they're kind of a bit of a necessary evil in that, like when you, there's a, there's a sense of kind of an echo chamber over the years of, and a lot of these bodies um, where there's the same people coming through the whole time running the business and you've seen it, in, it quite close to home in, in some organisations that that kind of set a rot nearly sets in when you're not open to new voices and you're not willing to let other people in. And I think it's really important for, for all sporting bodies and particularly when when you've got so many females playing a sport, like well, how can you have a, a governing body that doesn't that's not representative of the people that play the sport? It, it doesn't make any sense. And and a lot of the time, I think we've all seen. You, know, you mentioned some of the the kind of trailblazers that are in our sport at the moment in terms of of running, of running their sports. That the sports in particular, they've, they've had a huge kind of uplift. There's been a lot more interest in it. There's been new ideas brought to the table, new initiatives, and, and I think that's only a, a good thing for female sport. And yeah, um, like while they're well, they're not ideal, um, but we don't live in a perfect world. I, I, I'm all for getting as many, getting women onto these panels and bringing something new to it because they're, they're well qualified and well able to do the job. That's right, yeah. They're qualified to do the job because they're intelligent, not necessarily just because they're women. But uh, if, we're, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're focusing on, on just having 80 or 90% of our committees as, uh, as men, then we're obviously doing something wrong. Um, just a couple of other comments uh, coming in, some things that we'll come back to. Um, we've got one uh, asking you, Joe, about the partnership between Lidl and LGFA. I think that's something that we might come back to. I know you, uh, you used to work on Paddy Power. We did, a, we did a good webinar of Paddy Power's partnership with Leopardstown and looking behind the scenes and the nuts and bolts of that. We might do something uh, with yourself and ladies football over the coming weeks. Another one for, for maybe three to six months down the line. Um, uh, somebody here is saying that we've got uh, that this is maybe early in the impact study of COVID as to what's happened and that it would be interesting um, to have this same group gather back again in, say, six months time, perhaps, uh, so that we can look back a little bit on how it was. Touch wood, hopefully, that we've actually got sport back up and running by that time. So hopefully you'd be, uh, you'd be up for that as well. Uh, and the last positive point um, is, uh, is coming in from, uh, from Peter Smith here. Uh, who says that it, it, he thinks that the IOC exco is uh, is now gender equal uh, or certainly very close to it so uh, again we can look to the positives and take uh, comfort from that that things can indeed move in the right direction um, I don't want uh, to, to have the final word on this down to down to me so I just want to give an opportunity to uh, to, to Nora to Jenny and, and to Sene to just give us give us a one line uh, word of hope for uh, for the for the next year for the next 12 months that we first of all get out of this horrible virus and secondly that we do so in a way where we've got a more equal world in the world of sport um okay i'll go first maybe so i guess i was contacted by a director of one of the major ngbs recently and they asked me, you know, there, there's opportunities here. They're concerned that we, the focus that we have on women's sport might drop as a result of COVID-19. But there's opportunities. 
and they were really keen to see if other NGBs, other of the major NGBs would be interested in getting together and collaborating and looking at it from a commercial point of view, how do we maximize um, this time in order to either perhaps work together or learn from one another um, to really benefit women in sport. And I thought that was really positive coming from like um, one of the key NGBs in the country and um, to have that kind of foresight and to show that leadership um, where they're open to, to working together with other NGBs for the benefit of women in sport. And that's certainly something that we're, um, we're going to look into because I, I think we can. Um, and I think in women in sport, we can be innovative, we can be creative, we can, you know, let's do some crazy things at matches and events and games. Um, because I, I think we can try stuff in women's sport without worrying about the, the side effects of not bringing in money and things because we've never brought that much money in anyway. So um, we, can, we can try new ideas for women in sport. And I think let's um, use this as an opportunity. Okay, that's great. Uh, you know, something there's there's an element in there. You know, what sport for business builds bridges between sport and business, and it might be a useful conversation to have either in an environment like this, or heaven forbid, maybe back in the real world at some stage, socially distant, obviously, where we might get people like Joe and and others from the commercial world to come along and just widen out that debate as to what might be possible on a commercial basis. So, uh, so great point, uh, Jenny. Yeah, just to keep the momentum going. And like we said, it's not women supporting women, it's men supporting women and women supporting men through all of this. So I think that's a really important part to keep in it. Like a lot of people think, oh, it's women just trying to help women get better or get better roles or do better in sport, but it's not. It's societal change and to keep that momentum going and to especially keep it going at grassroots levels um, in terms of young boys and girls, two, three, four-year-olds, that they'll grow up knowing it as equal and men and women won't have favouritism in any aspect of sport. That's great. And Sene, final word to you. Oh, jeepers. Um, for me, the one-liner would be that together is better. Um, I think of all of the lessons that we're taking at the moment and still to learn is, is that, you know, we're all part of the same thing trying to achieve the same vision, which is equal opportunity for girls and women in sport. And so for my sport and rugby, you know, it's all about understanding, respecting, you know, the integrity and inclusivity with all of the stakeholders involved in our sport, from the volunteers, coaches, administration, players, you know, everyone um, is working together so that we can hopefully get ourselves back on, on the road safely um, towards uh, what I said to you for next year, some couple of pinnacle events for our sport. Um, but yeah, together is better. Great. Uh, fine, positive words to uh, to end on. I think the, the key to it is that it's, we're, we're looking for equal opportunity, that this isn't a case of men versus women. This is a case of, uh, you know, of women supporting women, but also of men supporting women. And we've all got mothers and sisters and nieces and daughters, and, and we want to give them an equal opportunity out there as well. Um, I'm heartened by the fact that the, the attendance today has been 40% male, um, which I think is a little bit higher than we would normally get. Uh, that it does tend to be, as Joe said, it sometimes tends to be an echo chamber that we're talking to all of those that actually sort of understand and know that this is the right thing to do. So I think it's a, it's a good positive that we're it, it, trying to achieve equality in terms of the debate as well as the actual um, actions that arise out of it. Um, my thanks to, uh, to you, Jenny, uh, back out on the water now early tomorrow morning. Um, to you, Nora, thanks a million for, for taking the time out on another uh, day of busy Zoom calls, but for keeping the momentum going. Um, thanks to, to Joe for joining us as well and, and for your continued uh, support of, uh, of Lidl through 20 by 20, through your support of the Ladies Football Association and of, of Sport for Business. And to you, Sene, thanks a million for taking the time out. Um, you're, you're, you've played at, at the, the highest level in the sport and you're continuing to do so now in the committee rooms as well. I think. The whole question of women in sport is in pretty good hands based on what we've heard here today. Uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, watch out on Sport for Business where we'll be back again with plenty more activity over the coming weeks and months. Thank you very much.